I wasn't going to miss my shot to have this guy in the studio. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. All right, you guys, welcome on in to The Point with Kristen Burr. I'm so excited you guys are here today. Did you like my little bit of twist on Hamil Hamilton there? I, you know, I try. And uh, introducing, take a look, right over here to my left is choreographer Derek Mitchell. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so excited that you are here. And uh, we, we will have to talk a little bit about Hamilton because sure. I know you worked on the show out here on the West Coast Companies, West Coast correct? Companies, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you're going to have a lot of Hamilton fans that probably have 18,000 questions. <laughs> I, hopefully, I will ask every single one of those 18,000 questions correctly. Um, but, you know, we were having a really great talk, like, kind of, like, before the show even began. Yeah. And, uh, you know, normally I don't start like this, but I think it's really interesting because you've really worked recently in both the New York and the LA markets. And um, I had started out my career in New York and came out here to LA, and I always saw that there were differences. But as, you know... TV became big and, and dance and, and TV really sort of melded together. I was always like, oh, maybe we've seen a little bit more of mm -hmm. the two worlds come together. But you're saying completely different still. Yeah, I think it's still um, it's very, very different. It's it's still New York is sort of the training ground for all dancers. It's where most of the dancers in the world go to learn their ballet, their tap, their jazz, mm -hmm. um, all their foundations. Um, and then L.A. is pretty much the place to like book work, um, to take class, but to take class to get filmed, take class to get a job, take class to be seen now, especially because of social media and mm -hmm. like Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. There are so many ways to be seen now where it's almost that you don't even need an agency per se. You can sort of just become your own celebrity in a way. And I think LA has always been sort of like that celebrity driven town because of Hollywood. And so what one of the most interesting just to even tie in hamilton like first off we had a invited call uh for the show and there were um 80 agency invited and an agency invited call is like one of those things like in new york you die for like that's right you, you have an appointment you have time an appointment. you're not waiting in line exactly it's not an open call it's not like a cattle call you literally go in and you have a set time and and you're re being requested so like they already know who you are and out of 80 people like i think like 28 or 29 showed up and my mouth just literally, I swear, like I, my mouth like dropped to the floor and I went, and when I told this story in New York, everyone was like, like <laughs> the class at Steps on Broadway that I was teaching, like Hamilton choreo, they were like, what? They were like so mad about it. Cause I was like, Less they would die for it. Mm -hmm. Less yeah. than 50% showed up. Less than 50%. And I was shocked and, and literally like Bernard Chelsea Casting even said like, that's LA. And I was like, why is this? I don't get it. Like everyone wants to work, but it's just a different way of going about the work. I think people want to be requested more rather and but it's I, just, I don't even know if it's that. I don't even then know. Then they were requested yeah, and they, they still didn't show up. Yeah. And I think too and I will say this cuz I have worked both markets. Um not both markets as a dancer. I worked New York as a dancer, not LA as a dancer, but I will say that the work ethic on the East Coast is very different than the work ethic yes. on the West Coast. Yes. And I get comments come my way all the time. You work so hard and I'm like right. if I worked this hard in New York, nobody would notice. Mm. I work this hard in LA and people take notice because I think people have a different, um, th we have beautiful sunshine, we've got beaches, we've got mountains, and I think there's a lot to distract us out here. Yeah. And it's not to say that I don't have fun, but on the East Coast, I just think we're everyone's a little bit more tunnel vision of like, I gotta get this job, I gotta get yeah. this show. But Whatever I think it's it is. also too like in New York, you're living in like smaller communal spaces, like your apartments are so much smaller, they're more mm -hmm. expensive, and so they tend to be your um, motivation for getting out into the city streets and like making something <laughs> of your life. Um, and just the general energy of New York is just one of a hustle. Go, know, go, the, go, 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 yeah. go. Whereas like LA, you wake up, you see the sunshine, like you're sitting on your balcony or you go to the hot tub or your friends are going on a hike. It tends to be very like nature and, and air oriented, which I love so much now at this mm -hmm. stage of my life. Um, but that being said, it does take a certain uh, type of person and a certain type of character to be able to self-motivate to be able to go out into the world and say, okay, today I'm gonna take, you know, blah, 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 amount of classes. I'm gonna go and, you know, write my agency. I need to be on these auditions because I heard these were coming up. Like to actually like self-motivate and also self-educate yourself on what it takes to be a success in an environment that seems a little bit more like lax. 
What does the New York dance community think of shows like So You Think You Can Dance? I know we do get New York dancers from time to time, but is it still, because this this happened a lot when I lived in New York, you know, it was like classical ballet, it was Broadway. Right. Um, those were the really, you know, held in high esteem. Out here we'd be like, oh, you're doing music videos, like whatever. <laughs> I, I, and you come out here and people are like, oh my God, you're doing music videos or you're on So You Think. Um, so it's, everyone has their own little bubble, but do people, because we do have a lot of So You Think alumni on Broadway now, but yeah. um, do you sit there and still, are those old attitudes still there? Or is it like a generational thing? I mean, I think that, um, I think we were very supportive as in the dance community just in general when So You Think started, because, you know, it was it was giving legitimacy and it was giving a bigger audience to dance. And then I think um, several negative things happened with exposure to the show, which was, one, we started realizing that the, and I just said this recently in class, um, that most of the choreographers who have become successful on that show are usually the storytelling choreographers. Mm -hmm. So, and usually the storytelling dances would be like the hip hop dances, the contemporary dances, and occasionally the Broadway dances as well would also have stories. But a lot of the choreographers on the show who've done like disco or Latin partnering, like Dorian Sanchez, I think is such an incredible choreographer, but never really gets talked about and, and stuff and hasn't enjoyed, like I would say that the large celebrity that someone like Mia Michaels or Travis Wall has or stuff like that. And I think people gravitates more towards storytelling. And I think that's the tricky part is that when you when you go back to New York City, like New York was sort of like that ballet, jazz, tap capital, and then tap didn't enter. So you think you could dance? I think almost until when Nigel did that number in like season six or seven or yeah, something. Yeah, and then we had a winner in season twelve, Gabby Diaz. Right, exactly. Wow. But Thank it took goodness. so long yes. to even get to that level. And then ballet, I don't even think I've really seen it that much on the show at all. Keon won and Eliana won season nine, but it right. wasn't. They were ballet dancers, but at the same time, exactly. the show still focused on other things. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So I think there's there's something about the so you think thing, and also too like most of the choreographers that have been showcased on So You Think You Dance are mostly LA based. So I think mm -hmm. the New York community is not against the show in any way, shape or form. Like we fully support the show. I think it's, um, and I of course love it. <laughs> I've submitted for it several times. Did you um, submit for this year, season um, 15? I actually am submitting on May 31st here at Debbie Reynolds Legacy oh. Studios. Yeah. Are they doing a little showcase? Uh, yeah, um, my agency, MTA agency is doing a um, like close submission thing. So I'm doing Fantastic. it. This will be my fourth time, yay. Jeff Thacker, you know, get on. I know. I. I Jeff apparently really likes my work, and I love auditioning for him. I just haven't found the right piece to get onto the that version of the show. So I'll give I'm you a couple hints for... post show. Okay, I know. <laughs> I'll give you a couple hints. I know what, what's he's his always favorite cookie? For... <laughs> it's his favorite cookie. Uh, well, they're right now in Academy. They will be selecting oh. um, the cast. Right. I will be meeting the official cast on Thursday. Oh, nice! That's fun. And then I have to keep my mouth shut until, of course, the for reveal. months until August. Yeah. I am embargoed until like August six, and I was like, "That's a long time for me to keep my wow. mouth shut." Wow, that's the NDA. Wow. Well, <laughs> yes, that's intense. It really is. I'm like, you guys, couldn't you do it like August first so I can just <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's it's tough when I talk for a living. But um, but yeah, you have worked on So You Think overseas, right? You worked in yeah. the Ukraine. Um, what was that like? Um, it's actually really interesting because I, I did not ever want to post my work on YouTube. Like um, my ex-boyfriend had kind of convinced me to do it. And he said, like, just put your work out there. Let's see what happens. And it was like 2000, I think it was nine, I'd started posting. And I was one of the few, like, people on YouTube for choreography. I think it was like me and Luam were like the biggest ones from like New York. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I get this random email this summer, um, that summer and said, uh, we would love to have you come in and choreograph some contemporary um, duets for So You Think You Could Dance Ukraine. And Ukraine has like such a huge audience because it's also looped in with Russia. So it has oh, like, nice. I think almost 20 million viewers a week, which is like one of the biggest Amazing. franchises of that. Is um, it still running? It's still running, Gosh, yeah. Gosh, wow, good. Yeah. I'm glad to I, hear that. Yeah, which is amazing. It's different producers from what I remember, but um, it is actually still running. Um, and they asked me to go over, and of course, like, there was the language barrier, but I was given translators, and I brought over an assistant. And I just remember, like, conceptually, they wanted everything written out ahead of time, so I wrote, like, two, like, really in-depth concepts after going through 30 selections of songs, which they said... You know, the, it's a different demographic. They wouldn't agree with the songs, wouldn't understand the song selection or stuff like that. So then I came up with two um, fully choreographed numbers, went in, and then they, I sat down at the meeting and they said, oh, no, you can't use those songs and we can't use those concepts. And I literally, like, in that meeting of an hour, had to come up with two brand new concepts and two brand new songs. And they wound up being, like, really, really great pieces. And one of them is, like, my favorite piece that I've ever, one of my favorite pieces that I've ever done. What is your favorite piece or one of? Um, for So You Think? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think my favorite one that I did was Not Over You. 
it's a Gavin DeGraw song. Um, oh, yeah. And I did it with this um, glass partition wall to sort of um, show how two lovers who had once been together had broken up but decided to live next door to one another. This was a very this personal situation. This is a situation. really good idea. Yeah, it's a really good idea. <laughs> you guys don't do this. <laughs> and they just couldn't sort of um, separate. And so we see their strife in mirroring choreography, but we also see through the glass pane and how their connection, even though there's a wall that separates them, their connection sort of never leaves them. Oh. And then they enter this sort of fantasy world where they get to be together again and live out the best of their relationship and the, their favorite moments. And then at the end, they're left to sort of see each other for the first time set in reality and and think, is this what we want? And I love to do that with pieces is like leave the audience with a question. I don't like to like fine tune anything. Let them answer Let it. Let them answer it, yeah. Because yeah. everyone's answer is different based on their experiences or their own drama. <laughs> Did you work with Gigi Torres? I know she worked on the show um, um, in We Ukraine. were not there at the same time. No, now. you weren't. Okay. We've submitted together for like the, um, uh, the one over here several times. You have? Yeah. I love Gigi. I she's love so Gigi. Sweet. We had her in here yeah. so she was so talking sweet. about work and she was like, I was just over there teaching and some guys came to the studio and they're like, do you want to choreograph or so you think you can dance? Are you serious? Great? Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel That's like, amazing. yeah, or, or she was in Turkey, like she was in some a foreign country and then they're like, do you want to just come and choreograph or oh so God, you think you can amazing. dance Ukraine? Yeah. Oh, no, you're I like, her. okay. <laughs> Sure. That's a nice way to get a job. <laughs> it's a great way to get a job. I mean, that's kind of fantastic. Um, I, I have to ask, and, and a lot of people are probably not going to know this name, but I do. I read in your bio that Frank Hatchett was one of yeah. your, your mentors. And uh, in the New York scene, Broadway Dance Center, Frank Hatchett jazz class was everything. Yeah, yeah, was it? it was everything. And um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is, and I've been saying this, I'm like, we are missing a classic jazz yeah. like like Frank used to deliver. Um, do you feel like there is room for like a little bit of a, a revival or a resurgence of this? Because I'm like, I want someone to bring it back. Or, yeah, or, I mean, or, or I, give it a little twist or, you know, give it a I little I mean, I definitely more. think it's still there. I think it's, it's, for some reason, it's seen as something dated and I don't see it as that at all. I think that a lot of people have taken that Frank Hetchett syllabus or like um, Gus Giordano or Luigi or... Um, Limon. Any of the, yeah. yeah, or any of those like old masters and sort of like developed onto it. I know I have in some ways. While my current work looks nothing like what Frank taught me, I think the structure of the jazz definitely influences my street jazz choreography or even my contemporary choreography. Um, but I think that there's there's something to be said about where jazz dance is going now because I do believe that people are starting to go backwards now, realizing the deconstruction of what's happened with like today's contemporary per se. Like um, I think because it's still being developed and we haven't specifically locked in choreographers saying like this is contemporary because mm -hmm. you can have like your Mia Michaels contemporary but then you can also have your slam contemporary you can have your my contemporary or Marinda Davis contemporary you can have so many different styles of contemporary you can have your more lyrical contemporary like Tracy Stanfield or Kristen Sudeikis so like you can you can definitely do more like storytelling you could do more broken movement you can do more um, athleticism with it. And right. I think back in the day, like obviously like with modern dance, modern meant new, contemporary means new. So because it's still new, I don't think we've stopped contemporary. Like, I don't think we're in that like book end. Yep. Like we started it, but we're not at the uh, opposite end of it. So I think it's still being developed and figured out. Whereas like modern, you can't create new modern dance. It, it would, It's either like Ailey or Limon right. or Stephen Graham. Yeah, Graham. Yeah. But, yeah, so it's, it's going to that. So you would know that that's modern, but now contemporary is still open. I think the door is still open. So I think we have to forgive that. But I also think that jazz dance is still alive and well. And Brian Friedman actually said this thing, I think it was like three years ago about that he's not gonna give up on jazz. And I was like, thank goodness, because like, he like actually really teaches jazz. I mean, yes, he I has like- I love jazz so much. I love jazz. There's an excitement to it. There's a performance to it. And I think it's why secretly people love musical theater so much is because it's so jazz infused, especially regionally. I wouldn't say so much Broadway has so much jazz dancing now, but regionally in all our older shows, jazz is such a big audience participatory and audience emotionally giving art form. So it's just, it's, it's electric. It's, it's fascinating to watch. It has so many levels. It's so dynamic. It allows for so much personality and character. So I don't think jazz is necessarily dead. I just think it hasn't fused correctly into this day and age. Yeah. Where we're used to attacking the camera in a different way than we would back with like Paula Abdul for Cold Hearted or like Michael Jackson for like Smooth Criminal. You know, like. 
Isn't it amazing though, too? I sit there and I think about this and we've talked about it on the show a lot. You know, I've had Vincent Patterson even here talking about, you know, Michael, but it's like, we've lost, we lost Michael. We lost um, Bob Fosse. We Mm -hmm. lost Michael Bennett. We lost Michael Peters. All of these like people who were, Mm -hmm. Frank Hatchett's no longer with us either. It's just, it's one of those things that we're, we lost all these great creators and I'm like, is anyone like really caring, you know, on the next generation of it? I don't, no. I mean, there definitely are. I mean, I can speak for sure. Like Sheila Barker, who is one of Frank's disciples yep. and, and another mentor for me, like she absolutely continues it on. I know Ginger Cox does, Tracy Stanfield does, Debbie Wilson does, Heather Oberly. Like there are so many people at Broadway Dance Center, Lane Knapper, like a lot of those people who are part of that or influenced by that Frank Hatchett legacy is definitely keeping jazz alive. And it's on the East Coast. So I wonder, what about, we know we have Brian Friedman here. We'll 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 take ownership of him, of (laughs) course. We love him. But is anyone else besides Brian here on the West Coast that you can think of? I'm just thinking because I'm like, I feel like, too, again, if you have East Coast and West Coast and no one's sort of like meeting in the middle on this. Yeah, I mean, there are some teachers at the edge from what I've seen that definitely keep like classic jazz alive, which I think is absolutely fabulous. I have yet to see that type of dance at the other studios, but I haven't really been like infiltrated into them yet mm-hmm. edge is usually where i spend most of my time so but i do see ja- jazz alive and well i just don't see the numbers that i think it deserves i agree because i think it's a tricky thing to be a choreographer and a creator nowadays is because most kids now don't know how to partner most kids don't know how to turn anymore they don't know how to stay on releve and even when i give like i remember teaching my contemporary class at, at the edge and a lot of people came out to me afterwards and go that's like one of the hardest warm-ups I've ever taken. I was like, is it? Like, to it's, me, I'm like, how can a, I be harder? How can I be more developed? How can I be like, you know, closer to Desmond Richardson? <laughs> like, uh, but I'm, I'm just thinking uh, like, how, how, do I, how do I become better? But, at, but from their perspective, it was so hard. And I was thinking, but if that's hard, then what, what are you doing? What are you taking? Like, what, are you, what classes are you, are you getting a warm-up? Are you getting a warm-up that's just stretching you or developing your technique or mm-hmm. strengthening your technique or strengthening your placement? And are the teachers smart enough to correct those things? So that that's that's the thing that scares me. Yeah, because then it's like, are, have we lost all of our fundamentals? And I, you know, I'm someone who also follows figure skating, and I follow gymnastics. Yeah. Gymnastics no longer has compulsories. Figure skating oh. no longer has figures. Um, I'm that's wondering yeah, if we're yeah. losing a lot of those basic components in warm ups. Because you know, if you went to a, a Luigi class, I mean, there's a oh, yeah. full set mm-hmm. warm up that mm-hmm. you do all the time. Um, and maybe it's it's become a lost art in, in all of these different ways, whether it's, you know, athletics or whether well, ballet, dance, any type of dance really is athletics. Too, yeah. But yeah, there's sometimes when I just watch like um, I did it like when I was in Hamilton, just because I wasn't um, I wasn't really focusing on creating. So I was able to like step away from the dance industry for a moment even though I was like at the top of it, it in was it, still yeah. Yeah, in it. <laughs> um, But I was able to separate myself and I thought, let me just watch these Instagram clips because obviously like my Instagram is filled with dancers and choreographers. So I just watched all these clips and I said, you know what, whichever clip makes me listen to it with sound is one that like piques my interest because I want to see if the visuals would stand out. I went through like 30 clips and nothing was making me like, and I wasn't paying attention to like, who they were by. And then this kid, um, Lucas, who had auditioned for the show, um, he was dancing in this clip and I just saw and I was like, oh, it's Lucas. And But I didn't know who the choreographer was. And it was just an unbelievable dance. And then I looked at the tag and I turned on the sound and it was Brian Friedman. I was, like, <laughs> so I, was like, I was like, okay, great, awesome. But it was jazz and it was also, it was street infused, obviously, like as his style is, but like it was just so rooted in technique and there wasn't just flailing the body around. And that was my thing is sometimes I, I like to just like watch clips and just see like for contemporary, like, Okay, have they done any classical positions? Have they do they have any lines? Have they turned at all with spotting? Are they utilizing the core principles of what would be ballet and jazz to get to contemporary? Right. Without just breaking everything. Because it's fine to deconstruct something, but you have to have had constructed it in the first place. You know what I mean? Yeah. And a lot of it, I think sometimes I get um frustrated when especially when you watch like audition rounds on a dance competition show and it's just like contemporary after contemporary yeah. number and I'm like it's just like let me do a trick let me like right. over 180 and that's amazing but at the same time I'm like I would rather see a leg a little bit lower if someone is exciting me and has a little yeah. bit more passion and a little bit of technique rooted in all yeah. of that but not so much technique that we lose all the emotion because sometimes you get the technicians and you're like right 
you can't be a robot either. So yeah. it's it's a tough balance sometimes. That's always my thing is like if I, I say this constantly and I'm sure every dancer who's ever taken from me is so bored of this story, but um, <laughs> whenever I create a piece, I always, you know, obviously like after the piece is being performed, someone's gonna come up to you and say something. So like I consider like these three statements to be like the death of art as we know it. It's three questions and they'll, or three statements. They'll go, oh my God, I loved your piece. Like the dancers were amazing fail oh my god what song was that i love that song fail oh my god your choreography is so good all fails and it's fails because you didn't tell me how you felt like, like you never talked about emotion. you talked about like what you saw or what you heard but you didn't tell me about what you felt and for me like that's like that made me cry right exactly and most of the time like if you watch like a little kid who's like performing who doesn't have the best technique but her heart's in it or his heart is in it and you just watch them dance you could absolutely cry watching them dance and just see the potential and i think now we're just dance is so overexposed and everything's so overexposed with social media like every news segment is just blown out of proportion every word is out of proportion that we forget that sometimes it's nice to just root for the underdog or to root for someone like growing and not necessarily being at like the pinnacle of their career but someone who's like working hard and like doing good things or like working passionately and connecting with you and that's like i feel like you can't teach that kind of stuff and no matter what what clip i look at on any of these social media things i very rarely feel like that person is reaching towards like through the camera towards me. Mm -hmm. And it's very rare that I actually like, cause sometimes I'll, I'll write a choreographer and I'm like, wow, I really love what you're doing. Cause I feel like now at 43, like I can do that. You know, like yep. I feel like it would have been arrogant for me cause I could have done it like 25 when I wanted to do it. But then people were like, what does he want? What does he want from me or stuff? I don't want right. anything from anybody. Like, no, I, don't, like, I really genuinely want to pass along yeah, a compliment I just generally to want to let you know like, hey, cause you might feel alone. I mean, we all feel alone in this industry, even if whether at the top, struggling, middle, just starting over, whatever we it is. We never think we're going to work again never i always think i'm never gonna work again. never gonna work again and every class routine i cry off i think well this is gonna be the last good one i have like do you think george clooney thinks he's never gonna work again that's what i want to know i mean when you reach that level yeah. but in dance are we ever reaching like the superstar like george clooney hugh jackman meryl streep level i mean i think it's you know what's interesting is that i think it's best as a dancer to not try to achieve fame because the second you achieve fame you've achieved something that's not, I don't think it's the most important thing. Like I'll, I'll say this, like Madonna obviously has worked her butt off to get where she is. She could literally do nothing for the rest of her life and still have just, I mean, all the money in the world and all the influence in the world. She consistently and constantly provokes, pushes, and- Reinvents. Reinvents constantly and constantly puts herself out there in a way. And I remember her Billboard um, Women in Music speech where she said, the most controversial thing I've ever done was to stick around. And I was like, wow, that's actually absolutely the point of art. Point of art is not is to influence regardless of your state of mind, regardless, regardless of your stature, regardless of your monetar monetary means, regardless of your talent. It's just that you need to put your art out there mm -hmm. and you need to put it out there with conviction and with passion and with integrity and authenticity so that people have something to connect with. But if you're pushing it out there to become famous, it, it it detracts from the value of it. I don't think Madonna tried to be, yes, she said it like early on, I just want to rule the world or I want to. Yeah, and she was provocative in what she said, but I think she believed it though too. Like it right. came from, you know, she was a badass when she came she out. Was. She, she, she still was, is. She, I mean, still, she still is. I just thought last night too, she was at the Met Gala performing and I'm like, do you feel I like- I want to see that performance so bad. Oh, I saw the clips of it, but The it wasn't, clips, the yeah. costumes, but I was yeah. like, oh my gosh, the whole world finally just caught up with Madonna. Yeah. It took us, what, 30, 40 years? I know. She's been around that long. She's been around since the 80s. It's kind of crazy when you think She's, about it. I love that woman. Have you ever worked with Madonna? Uh, <laughs> these are my stories with Madonna. Okay, so let's hear them. They're actually kind of interesting. Um, first time, yeah. So first time I met her, I was in charge of her dressing room when she was surprise presenting at the, um, they were doing a tribute to her at the 2001 Video Music Awards, or it's nine nine nine. Whenever it was at the Metropolitan Opera House, I forget what year that was, but I was in charge of like all food services. Is that so, the like the one that was the day before nine eleven? Uh, no, I don't. I think it was earlier than okay. that. Okay, I think it was earlier than that. Okay. Um, but TLC was doing waterfalls, and then she, um, there were all these like Madonna impersonators. Left that came Eye out. was still alive. Yes. Oh yeah, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
so that was the first time. The second time I did um, styling with Josie. He's like the creative director for um, Elle magazine and he's had his own magazine. And I think he's, he always hosts the Oscars mm -hmm. um, the, over like red carpet stuff. Um, and we had worked together like styling for about four years. He brought me on as a consultant with him and as an assistant stylist because he wanted like just to know how to dress dancers and all that kind of stuff and like what would work. And he just, I think wanted to just sort of mentor me. So it was an unbelievable experience and I got the chance to work on the Madonna Missy Gap commercial. I think we have a photo of that. If you can put it up, I think I pulled that. Oh, that's fun. Yes. And I want to tell you that my style in 2004 yes. was totally the was wife it? beater with the heels <laughs> and the little crop jeans. And if I could wear that every day for the rest of my life, I'd be super happy. Nice. I know. I don't know if I'd wear the little page boy cap, but uh, <laughs> I don't, yeah, me so and he, hats are a little weird, but. Yeah, so um, Joe came up with Madonna about the idea of like doing like the whole like M and the embroidery, which of course sold out at like every gap. Mm -hmm. um, and then I styled the dancers and that's how I met like most of um, Justin and Madonna's dancers. Um, and then I taught her daughter at Steps on Broadway, Lourdes. Oh, Lourdes. So Lourdes so was Lola. taking my contemporary classes there. And then I submitted for, um, oh, and then I also met Madonna on the Oprah Winfrey show, like when I had to bring the gap dancers Wait, wait, wait. So then he just, wait, boom, just dropped Oprah Winfrey's <laughs> no, name. No, 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 but I wasn't on it. Like I was, I was I know, but, scenes, but you saw Oprah in person is always was, a good yeah, thing. That was a lot. Yeah. I was like, oh my God. I know. But like those two legends walking at you, I was like, I don't even know which one I'm more excited about. I was like, Oprah or Madonna, who knows? Everyone <laughs> comes to Hollywood. That, I yeah. don't want me singing anymore, but that, that <laughs> commercial was, was, I mean, that ran nonstop, yeah. nonstop for quite a while. For quite a while. It was so much fun. Yeah, that, that's probably the last time I shopped at The Gap, too. That whole outfit, like, head to toe, that was me. Yeah. If anyone wanted to know what I look like in 2004, <laughs> I was dressed <laughs> like Madonna. Um, so let's talk about Hamilton because this thing, I'm the only person in the universe that has not seen it. I tried to get tickets here in LA and oh, like no. every time. I wish I had known you. <laughs> like, like I, I wish know. this was like six this months ago. This is ridiculous. Um, and, you know, I haven't been to New York in, in time to see it either. But uh, it's, it's a phenomenon and it's unbelievable. And yeah. Lin-Manuel Miranda is... I mean, he's reached, he's beyond just Broadway, which I think is really, really important yeah. because anytime we, someone breaks through and everyone knows his name and knows who he is and knows yeah. his work, that's amazing. Because yeah. that's rare. That is, a, that is a rarity, I think, in 2018. Yeah. He's just incredibly, incredibly gifted and very humble, which is... How do you like stay humble? Honestly, like I was just a normal wonder. person. Like honestly, I've never all the times that I met with him or talked with him, like he's literally just a normal person. Like you would never guess that he's like who he is. He, yeah, I, I honestly can say that. Like there's no like pretense that. about him whatsoever. And I, I see like every morning on Twitter, you know, he does sort of like his his motivational, morning yeah. motivational, yeah, and evening motivational sort of statements and tweets or whatever. And that gets retweeted. It goes through my feed like yeah. 1800 times every day it's yeah. unbelievable so people are really inspired by him how did you come aboard hamilton um about i think it's now it's i think it's about 14 or 15 years ago now i was auditioning for um two off broadway shows that i was choreographing for in those auditions were the associate choreographer stephanie clemens mm -hmm. um and then three of the cast members seth stewart ricky tripp and there's one other person i can't remember anyway um those people were all in Lynn Monroe and Andy Blankenbuehler's world. Yep. Um, not at that time. Stephanie Clemens, I gave the first job in New York to. It was her like first gig as a dancer. Seth Stewart had just come off the Madonna uh, reinvention tour. Mm -hmm. So technically he said that was his first job in New York. And Ricky Tripp, who's also in um, uh, Hamilton as well, it was also his first job in New York. 14 years later, and friendships later and stephanie i've you know kept in contact with throughout the years and watched her like blossom into this amazing talent on broadway um emails me while i was teaching over in europe i was in paris and i opened up my email and i saw hey it was a really really quick email i was like hey derek hope you're well i'm not sure if you're traveling or not but love to speak with you about being um resident choreographer for um the first national tour of hamilton and literally my mouth just went Hey. I mean, just like dropped to the floor and I was like, what you doing? But I literally was like, what? Yeah. Like I was just confused. Cause like there was no, like there was no lead up to that. I wasn't trying to do that. Like I was like busy doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. And she goes, let me know if you want to do it and give me a call. So I called her 
and I spoke with her about it, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, we would just need to set up a, a meeting so that Andy can meet you and blah, blah, blah. Now, was she in the show or was she working behind Associate the scenes? Associate choreographer. Associate choreographer. Yeah. So she was working as Andy Blankenbuehler's assistant. Yeah. So she's basically the one that like sets all the companies. Perfect. So Andy choreographs everything. And then Stephanie is the one who like miraculously puts it all together, which is not That's an easy feat. huge. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a ridiculous job. Um, and so after that conversation, I can honestly tell you, and she knows too, like my gut said no. It was really, really weird. I had like, and that was the first time I didn't follow my gut. I'm a little shocked, gut. honestly. Yeah, my gut was actually no. And it was interesting because I, there's something I pride myself on. And I, I don't know if pride gets in the way at times. It probably does. But I, I love the fact that wherever I've gotten in my career, I didn't get it through favors. I didn't get it through cronyism. I didn't get it through um kissing you butt. know kissing butt like i didn't do any of those things i worked like if i if i'm a teacher now which i am i literally started making ten dollars at a neighborhood studio around the corner from my house teaching two times a week for two years then started teaching like at a convention then started teaching multiple conventions then kids programs then adult program i mean like i've You've put never in got, your time i've put in my time i'm still putting it in here i still don't even have a slot out in la and i've been out in la since august 6th and i'm i've been on like i literally had a post about this recently i was like i'm on the cover of dance teacher magazine <laughs> i've taught in 40 countries on six continents i've literally won like a slew of awards. I've choreographed for so many different people and so many different things, and I can't get a slot. So, but I love that. There's something that I love about it because it makes me always reevaluate where I am. And what I love the most about what I've done is that I have earned each step. Even if I take like two steps forward, one steps back. Thanks, Paul Abdul, for that. <laughs> um, but even if I take like two steps back, at least I know all these steps are mine. Whereas if I you know, through social media, let's say like I put out a post and blah, 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 and I just got, I did really, really well and got a lot of views. And then I get shot to the top and I have like 300,000 followers and I get like all these jobs teaching and stuff. Then if I fall backwards, I fall straight back to the bottom because I didn't earn those steps that got me all the way there. Right. I've earned every single step. I've taught horrible classes. I've taught amazing classes. I've taught kids, I've taught adults, I've taught jazz, tap, ballet. I mean, you name it, like I've taught it all. And so I have something to stand on. And as much as that's, it can be annoying at times because sometimes you're like, I've been around for this long, I deserve this. Like, I realize like, I don't deserve this. You constantly have to prove yourself in this industry. Right. And like, I literally just had to talk a te talk with a teacher in New York who was saying, I don't want to sub anymore. I was like, girl, I was like, I'm 43 and I'm subbing. And she went, what? She goes, I was like, yeah. I said, even I can't get a slot. And she goes, wow, really? And I was like, she goes, okay, I, I'm going to continue subbing. And I was like, yeah, that's what it's about. Like. I don't walk into the edge thinking like I'm all that because like here I am. Yeah, like here I am. You're so lucky to have me. But like, but when I go in and I teach those four people or ten people or twenty people, whatever it is, and it's not seventy five people with a wait list, I'm still like I'm grateful that those four people uh, that I have the opportunity to inspire them. Yeah, and that I have the opportunity to educate them in whatever way I can, and that they showed up. They took an hour and a half out of their day to That's come. Right, being present is. Is yeah. half the battle. So I'm just, I'm thankful for that thing. Um, getting back to Stephanie. So I was like, so that. <laughs> yeah, so the so the gut thing was just like. Just like, no, not, not at yeah, this time. Yeah, I, I felt like, it's not that I didn't deserve it. I just felt like it wasn't, it didn't make sense in the course of my life in, in what I was preparing for. Even though I've always wanted to choreograph my own Broadway show, like absolutely, that's still a dream. It but felt, it, it didn't felt even, odd. It, it felt odd, but did it, it didn't even feel like, oh, great, I will get some of this under my belt and understand some of the inner workings of a Broadway show or a national no, tour. No, it did. Yeah, no, absolutely, for sure. And that's the reason why I took it is because I said, you know what, I want to, let me do like a year, year and a half, two years with this. And let me, let me just see like what I can learn from this. And then I literally like, I felt as if I learned what someone would take four years to learn and get a master's in. Like I, the genius of that show was just so beyond even i had seen it 10 times already by the way before i got the job you're a super fan already already a super fan and i just remember like watching everyone work and when you watch people like andy or tommy kale or alex lackamore like and stephanie clemens and patrick vassal like you watch these people work and put together this show and you're like wow okay i even need to step up my game because i felt like i was already producing like work that was really good and work mm -hmm. that i was proud of and I know how to run a room. I know how to treat dancers. I know how to choreograph. Like I know I've done over 300 industrials. Like I know how to do this. Yeah. And then Hamilton made me feel like, oh wow, I still have so much to learn. And I was like, 
good, good for you. 41 years old, still have to learn. Like that, and it was- Always a student. Always a student. The second was, you stop learning, we're dead. It was amazing. The and having to learn dead. like two hours and 20 to 28 minutes of like musical staging and choreography and blocking and and then knowing how to run a cast that you didn't choose. Like that was, that was a real big thing. Cause normally I'm always choosing my own dancers. Mm -hmm. So I've been a leader, but a leader of my people. This was how do you lead people who you've never met before yep. and who are not necessarily needing something from you. They already have something. So like, it's how do you work in like, almost like an office type scenario, but still be creative. So it was, it was incredibly challenging and I learned so much from it. Like now, honestly, I know I can do anything. Like if you can run Hamilton, you can literally run anything, like anything. That's amazing. Yeah. Can I could do the Super Bowl by myself, I promise. Can you run the White House? No. <laughs> just, that's it. Not for the political I mean, talk. I just had to ask. I mean, yeah. Just the, the, the question came to my head. Gonna, I'm sorry, guys. a lot of listeners with this no, one. I was like, no, we're not going to talk about the White House. But. I don't think the people in, in the White House can run the White House. <laughs> so here's the deal. Uh, th what does... When you're coming into a show that's already running, um, mm -hmm. they're rehearsing, you know, Andy's rehearsed them or whatever, are, you step in, like you're, you're sitting down in, in San Francisco. I know you guys sat down in San Fran and in well, LA. I'm, yeah. Well, actually, um, I learned the show with the Chicago company. So like okay. when that first um, sit down started, I spent the eight weeks with them, learned the entire show. Then um, in that time, I wrote the choreography Bible for the show. I charted the entire show on stage, right? Um, and then I began like working on tracking sheets and stuff like that. And then I work tracking with, sheets just so everyone understands every character has a track. Yeah, a track. And if <laughs> this happens too, if you're if someone is out sick, mm -hmm. there are understudies to step in. If multiple people are out sick, understudies will cover sometimes two or three tracks. So sometimes they're, they're singing horrible, one. Yeah. yeah, if everyone's out with the flu, yep. singing one track, dancing another track, it's really complicated. So yeah. I just wanted to throw that that term out for everyone. Yeah. And then I spent uh, another three months on Broadway, um, still learning the show. And then in January, we started rehearsals with my cast. So my cast, I was in from the beginning. So oh, good. for that first day. Um, and then I was just in charge of them through San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles, and San Diego. And I left the show um, at the, like, the third week of San Diego. So do you come in at, um, when they have like a dance call, a dance rehearsal, and clean things up for them? No, no, no. As a resident for this show, because it's such... It's such an unbelievable, like if you've seen the show, you know how detailed it is. If you mm -hmm. haven't seen the show, like it's it's unlike any other Broadway show that I've ever seen and I've seen hundreds. Like it's the most detailed, the most specific piece of art that I've seen. Like there's nothing left to chance. And even if there is, it's still within the realm of like the controlling atmosphere of like stay in this scene, stay in this um, general idea. That being said, it's it's one of those shows where every single every single moment matters. And so to learn all that, you need someone who's in the building all times. I would watch four shows a week, two that I would note, two that I would just keep my eyes on, but you're in, this, in the theater for the other four shows. So you're in all eight shows, every put in, every dress rehearsal, running the auditions, so literally like, and note, note sessions, meeting with the cast. Understudy um, rehearsals. Understudy yeah. rehearsals that are concurrent with the show. So literally like everything that's on schedule you're doing, which is, Unlike, usually resident choreographer is not like a title that people use, it's usually associate. So like if it's like a dance show that has like 10 minutes of dance in it, you would maybe go in like once a month or once every two months mm -hmm. and you just have your eyes on it, which is what Stephanie yep. does. Like, so Stephanie like goes in and she'll spend like a week with one company and then a week with another and we, you know, so now there are five companies. So she like travels all around and just- a cool job. Yeah, she puts her eyes on everything and she just gives, you know, her expertise and, and to, you know, what might be just slightly askew and off and, and then making changes because the creatives love to come in and like actually like fine tune the show, which is, I think it kind of important. It kind of takes away the idea of freezing a show, which freezing a show basically just means like usually by the end of previews, hopefully by opening, a show is frozen, which means it doesn't change. No changes, yeah. Um, but this one, even though it's frozen, it's not frozen like the show frozen, but like even <laughs> though it's frozen, it still does change um, quite a bit. Which That's, is interesting. That so it keeps you on your toes, yeah. Yeah, and then also keeps it creative. I, I love that with Avenue Q. Avenue Q yes. was constantly, constantly with the end number, evolving yeah. and changing and things like that. And that keeps it f refreshing for an audience that probably, there's probably plenty of people that went in and saw it five, ten times because of that, too. <laughs> Avenue Q yeah. also, I love that. I saw it three times. Yeah, so. I mean, it's it, th that does. It keeps you buying tickets because you're like, what are we going to see tonight? Or like this, yeah. especially when it's like hot topics of things that's happening in the news. You're like, I wonder if they're going to talk about that. And usually yeah. it's been slid right in there, which is amazing. 
You talked um, about industrials, and this is a big thing. We, we really haven't talked about it here on the show. It's a big thing in the dance world, especially in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, can you explain what an industrial is so everybody knows, first sure, of all? Sure. So an industrial is basically just uh, when a corporation or a product, like the, let's say it's like um, Ameritrade um, or the NBA. It could even be an industrial or for the Sears, NBA. Or Sears. Or Sears. Derek yeah. Huff. So basically, um, they would basically hire me to come in and um, choreograph in support of their product. So it'd be um, meeting with the executives to talk about like, well, this is our costume idea because this, in that particular instance, for yeah, the Sears, Steve, if you they can just pull wanted... up that photo of Derek and Emma, that'd be awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So for that one, they just basically it was all about um, the jean scene, and so basically Sears was doing this um, campaign to sell these jeans. And so they thought about bringing Derek Huff in to perform. And so I was like, oh, that's awesome. So I hired all these dancers and we had the rehearsals um, separately with Derek and then separately with the dancers and then kind of brought them all together on the day of, which is typical with talent like that. Um, But yeah, industrials are basically just the, it's, I guess you can even say it's somewhat a flash mob, although, because some can be surprise events. Most of them are usually, you know, it's it's a planned performance, but it's, it's specifically to sell a specific product. Yeah. Or to showcase some sort of entertainment value at like a corporation or something like that. Like we did an industrial for Hillary Clinton was doing us a, um, a speech up in Boston, and so it was called an industrial. Yeah, and it's, it's, yeah. Are, is Equity still covering industrials? The Equity, uh, the Actors Union used to, and then not the ones that I've done. No. Okay, so I it's, mean, yeah kind of a free-for-all it's the wild west when it yeah, comes to which means that i have to fight for rates all the time like i'm always fighting for dancers rates and it's it's so tricky because most you... of the clients don't understand that dancers don't work for free <laughs> like they still don't understand that i don't in 2018 yeah, yeah you I need to, not that. only do they need rehearsal pay they need performance pay and oh, they then, need per diem if oh, it's out of town yeah, no. yeah and yeah. they think they supply their own costumes they do their own hair and makeup like they they really they just don't care and i don't know why where do you think is because industrials i did a lot of industrials when i was living in new york and i, I sit there and I, I see you know obviously they're hiring emma slater from dancing with the stars and, and derek at the time was on da- dancing with the stars so they're paying them right. some decent rates exactly um but where do you see like the people that are in the background dancing behind them are you seeing rates go down over 10 years ago or have they gone up have they stayed steady do you know i feel I actually think they've gone down as much as I'd like to say they've, they've gone up and, and, and supply hope. I feel like they've gone down. I feel like um, there's an undercutting that's happening now. And I do in part blame social media for it because um, it's now possible basically to get your headshots done by someone who has no, no idea of what developing a photo is like. Right. They don't know what a dark room is. They don't know the chemicals that are involved. They've never went to photography school, yet they're doing headshots. We have tons of these people now. And some are good. Some are really great. Right. And they have an iPhone, and it works. But I think that you get what you pay for. And the problem is, is now we have so many choreographers now who have not had experience as dancers due to social media. So they never really danced before. They just got thrust into teaching because they found like some dancers and did a couple of cute eight counts, got this celebrity thing going, and then don't realize that they have to take care of their dancers. Me as a dancer, like for so many years, I remember like how difficult it is to work for like 50 bucks. <laughs> like I remember doing an off-Broadway show and I got paid 50 bucks and I was like, is this worth it? But it was. Yeah, because you it was love for it every me night. And I loved it, but I actually thought like, could I live on this? And I was like, not in Manhattan. No. no. <clears throat> not in Manhattan. But I even don't think like when it really comes down to it, when I really th- look at like tour salaries or like even Broadway salaries, I actually don't think it's a lot. I really don't. Like, and it, it's, because well, really, like the minimum for equity is like I think it's eighteen twenty two, which after taxes, agency fee, and equity dues, you're lucky you're cracking a thousand a week. I don't think that's a lot of money. It's it's to not. And shows. I I will say that my my husband did um, a CETA contract, um, which see here's here's a little we're throwing out a lot of terms, but um, a national tour contract, like the production level contracts, are mm-hmm. rare these days. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones people could stay out on the road for years, and then they could like get off the road, buy their big right. you know house or their their big apartment in Manhattan and go back and do Broadway that doesn't exist anymore they're 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 few and far between I don't yeah. know if Hamilton is a production contract but CETA seems to be the one that equity has allowed you know a lot of producers to do if a yeah. show's been on the road a long time um and the difference between like a production national tour contract and a CETA contract is like this and that mm-hmm. so it's tough I think it happens now but just because <laughs> when the choreographers undercut the teachers have to undercut the students have to undercut the dancers have to undercut so like it's it's I think it's a snowball effect yeah I really do because I know that I can't 
pull the rates sometimes for teaching that I was pulling before because a 20 year old who has parental support or stuff like that, or is living with a bunch of roommates can take 300, 400 less an hour. You yeah. know, they could do it for like a hundred an hour. They're like, oh yeah, I'll totally teach that. Or like, I'll go to like, you know, Brazil and I'll teach this workshop for, and I'm like, why are you going down for that money? Cause like, cause that actually sets an example for then, oh, if we can get this person for this amount, oh, then we don't need to pay all that. But then you get what you pay for. Like, right. I, I do believe like dance is a specialty and it needs to be treated like it's something special. You know, like dancers have to be treated better and dancers have to be rewarded more. Cause remember like they can't do, like dancers cannot dance 40 hours a week. Like if they do, they're doing- a, Their body's gonna fall yeah, off. Their body's gonna <laughs> fall off and they're doing a, an actual like disgrace to their bodies if that makes sense. Yep. You know, so like it is a specialty. So like the rates have to go up. They do have to go up and, and you know, it's it's tough. I mean, certain things are controlled by SAG if right. it's a union job, but there a lot of the jobs are non-union and that's where you can get a company that'll pay you lots of money and you're like, oh my God, that was the best industrial ever. Yeah. And then you get the other, you know, you get the other side of it where you're like, I did that for $200. <laughs> but you know what? Sometimes people just want to work and they'll take the $200 yeah. too. It does happen. Yeah. It's kind of scary. Um, we'd love to know, since you're now out here in LA, what are your LA goals? I know, well, obviously you've got So You Think, possibly, auditioning. Yeah, I have, at the end of this month, I'm doing, um, my dancers are gonna perform the same piece at Carnival that they're doing for the- Choreographer's so Carnival. Choreographer's Carnival. It's like, a, it's the 300th celebration, so it's like this big special event where like, um, just like the biggest choreographers are gonna be asked to do a piece. So I'm doing like a two minute piece and then I'm doing the same piece the next day at So You Think. Um, and I'm hoping the four time, the fourth time is the charm. Okay. I mean, yes, we need to cross. I know, we need to cross this. both fingers on this. Fourth uh, time is the charm. It's gotta be. Yeah, you're like, Jeff, I'm here. I'm here. I'm ready for you. I am ready. Season 15 uh, contestants. And I've done it. I've choreographed 15 pieces for the show like overseas. Like I know how it works and all Yeah, that you're stuff, like, so. I understand how to put together yeah. Oh God, yeah. the package, the yeah. lighting, the costumes. I mean, obviously. And that, you know, when Spencer Liff, we had him in here, he said his first time, that was the hardest, that was the biggest learning curve for him because right. it kind of threw him in it and then it was really awful. And he had to beg Jeff Thacker to give him a second chance because he's like, I know how I, how I can do this better. So, wow. yeah, I mean, it's 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 a tough one. Yeah, I mean, I've I've definitely had experiences overseas with the so you think brand of having to argue about specific things, and I'm like, we discussed this in the production meetings. That's what all those pre-pro meetings are about. Is like, let's discuss the wardrobe, let's discuss our sets, let's discuss our camera angles, let's discuss the lighting, and let's not have surprises. 10 minutes before like when we end the dress rehearsal you know the like, poor dancers too exactly yeah they're contestants yeah because they're going on live television and they're freaking out as it is they want to be taken care of so like yeah so i'm hoping that works through and then um obviously like teaching and stuff um my my major goal of being out here is to work in tv and film um like tv again for like so you think and stuff like that and doing commercials um and film just because i've i've that's the one industry that i've done like small you know student films and stuff like that but nothing like film film um i kind of just want to get a shot to do something like a like a grease live or like a marguerite mm. derrick's like spy who shagged me like one of those like big hollywood like things yes i love putting together stuff like that like the more dancers there are the better for me i thrive in like those like high pressure situations if it's just like a duet i'm like oh great awesome but like if you give me 200 dancers i'm like yes like, here i we got go. this yeah, yeah this, it gives you like the excitement of yeah. like getting up in the day going oh my gosh we got the big crowd scene today yeah. we're gonna do this i literally awesome. had like an uh a conversation with my agent uh jim keith and he said uh we were at dinner and i said to him i said I just want to get in the room. I said, because if I can get in the room with the executives, I promise they'll do whatever I want. I was like, but just get me in the room to talk to them because I can pitch you anything. I can literally pitch anything. And I've had to just because of life and experience and yeah. stuff. And that's good because pitching is, you know, pitching your ideas, pitching your, your creative mm -hmm. is one of the hardest things. That's one of the hardest business. things. You got to Because to get an yourself. executive who's maybe not necessarily creatively, you know, inclined to understand, they just want to understand like, oh, I heard about this. Let's do that. You know, like a lot of clients will come to me and say like, oh, I heard flash mobs are great. Let's do a flash mob. And I'm like, okay, but I need you to tell me like, what are you, what are you hoping to get out of this? What is your monetary, you know, value for this? Like, who is your age range that you want this to reach? Yeah, like, not just this random video you saw on YouTube. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I'm going to be able to bring you all that insight by just asking you a series of questions. Like, what exactly is it that you want? Because then I can help you, I can help you get it. But if you just give me a blanket idea, I'm like, uh. And sometimes in the end, 
they never wanted a flash mob. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Like, it's sure. true because by the time you circle back, you're like, oh, actually, you want a production number, number. Yeah. on a stage. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny, though? Because it's, it is, yeah. at, when you're a creative brain and you work with a corporate brain, like, finding ways to meet in yeah. the middle is super important yeah. because sometimes when I even talk to like, the corporate side, I'm like, okay, let me just, like, fix my creative brain and, and figure out like what they're what they're looking at because it's yeah. a very different view than what creatives look at yeah which is unbelievable well we're excited you're out here on the west coast Thanks. oh no and you know too. thank you for all of your insight because i think um you know the new york la thing has has long been there it's interesting to see where the differences are and where some of the similarities are in 2018 and uh I, you know i hope somehow we all sort of meet in the middle on all yeah, of that. It's really important. Great. It's so important. Believe it or not, the hour's up. Did you know that? Oh my goodness, really? I know. I'm not oh. kidding. I know. Every time I'm always like, guys, we're done. They're like, what? So um, for people that are not following you yet on social media, where can they find you? Oh, so Instagram and YouTube, uh, the handles are Derek Mitchell G, um, G for great. I don't know. Because you're a G? <laughs> Actually, G is like the um, initial to my last name. But Derek Mitchell G um, on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Yeah. All those good things. All, all right, those well, good things. Catch up with Derek, you guys, on all the social medias. And of course, you guys, next week we have Kevin Fry coming in. He's also going to be t bringing in his mentee. So we're going to talk a little bit about mentoring in the dance industry, which nice. I think is a good thing and definitely needed. Oh, yes. So you guys join me here next week, same time, same place. And of course, for all of your latest dance news, visit dancenetwork.tv. Thanks so much to Popcorn Talk for hosting us here today. Baby, I'm From the producers star. Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit PopcornTalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.